for those that don't know me already from the Innersource Commons Foundation, um, I have a background in doing large-scale Innersource programs and have done so before um, for a bank where we've um, we, um, generated probably about $50 million worth of code reuse. Um, I've also worked um, with the Gen AI startup and been a director of engineering um, at Deloitte. So I've had a fair number of experience of working with lots of different companies and talking to them about their in-source programs. If you want to get in touch with me at all, LinkedIn, um, GitHub are probably the best way these days. So um, today we're talking about how in-source practices can help bridge the gaps between platform engineering teams and the developers, the consumers of the platform. Um, often platforms will struggle with adoption, and this is what in source can fill this gap. We'll look at how the collaborative de development models can make a difference in this context, and how that can help you build scalable different um, developer-friendly platforms. And how in source can help with the cultural and process alignment and, and necessary to make these changes. So we just listened to the talk um, previously and mentioned developer experience, but I always like to make sure that everyone has the same uh, sort of baseline. There's no formal definition of what developer experience is, but for me very much, it's I view it as that lived experience of an engineer building and running systems, focusing on people and what they need to be effective and safe. Now, I call out just um, about the use of effective, I choose effective very deliberately instead of efficient. Um, there's a lot of talk about productivity and developer productivity, um, but I think that for me, developer experience is very much about enabling developer teams to be effective. So why is it important? Um, I do think we had the DevOps revolution and we had um, shift left in lots of different aspects of, you know, from security and infrastructure. But it's led to a development cycle these days that becomes much more complex. And there's much more intersecting points within the SDLC. Um, and it leads to lots of different, leads to lots of friction. Um, these are two um, samples from surveys. The top one is from Atlassian, the, the state of developer experience, where um, over two thirds of developers lose eight hours per week to inefficiencies. Now, if you think about um, if you've got 100 engineers or 1,000 engineers, that adds, that's the cost of that inefficiency quickly stacks up. Um, and according to a Forrester um, snapshot survey as well, <laughs> um, companies with DX program, 74% um, see improved productivity. So there's something certainly important here. Again, with platforms, everyone here should probably understand the definition of platforms. Everyone has their own view, but I'd like to call out that the Platform very much is a foundational element on which other systems and services are built. It's not the end result, but it's the fact that platforms provide the right abstractions for other teams to build upon. Platforms, again, is a very wide name, but it's we um, got to focus on one particular type here. So platforms come in the types of, you know, you might have a marketplace where it'll match buyers and sellers together around the service. Sometimes around experience, and um, in this context, you know, you, when you sit at home and watch Netflix, you're kind of consuming the experience of the Netflix platform. Um, some are based upon uh, different ecosystems, and you know, how do you API enable uh, your data and your services and help other people build on top of that? Um, for me, that's very much an ecosystem platform and Salesforce. But as this is an inner source summit, what we're going to look at is the foundational platforms. Um, platforms of which are based around cloud security and DevOps pipelines, because these are often used internally in the company. Um, and that's where I believe that inner source can play a major part. So what does it make take to have a good platform and to have great adoption um, and a great developer experience of the platform? Well, first of all, I don't believe that there's things as good and bad platforms. There are great platforms and there are platforms which are aspiring to be better. Um, great platforms very much focus on the customer um, that may be a developer, it may be a different persona, um, but generally an engineer within internal platforms. They have a very clear value proposition. You know what you're going to use them for and what the value you get is. Um, they own the problem space. Now this is, I, I love this phrase about owning the problem space. Um, often platform teams sometimes will think about they own the tools. Um, but owning the problem space is much more powerful um, it's, for instance, if you look at CI/CD platform, you might say that they own the um, <clears throat> enterprise build tool, and they will service that build tool. And if something's wrong with the build tool, they'll fix it and patch it and upgrade it, and look after it. If, on the other hand, you start thinking about, um, I own the problem of um, the local feedback loop for developers uh, and the build process, it suddenly opens up so much more than just a tool. It's like, well, we can solve this problem in many different ways. 
Um, you think about, you know, you think about the problem space and what you're trying to solve. So that's a very much a developer-centric design as opposed to a government-centric design. Um, and you know, it goes through, you know, with a great platform, you'll have self-service and with aspiring, not so much. And you have great documentation because it should be easy to use. All you're trying to do effectively is empower those development teams to make their own decisions and um, to have own their own destiny, and they're generally going to be happier and much more productive. So how does this manifest? You know, that this, you know, there's a lot of there between you know the the mandated approach to things and the the customer centric approach. Um, as a how does this manifest itself in terms of platform and platform adoption? Well, often you kind of look at the roadmap, right? Um, you know, look at the platform team will demonstrate what they're working on this quarter. Um, they'll say these are the things we're working on, and they'll generally be, you know, like all good, you know, product teams, platform teams, they'll look at the things which are of high value um, that they can implement within that quarter. And then there, in the backlog, there'll be lots of little items which are uh, somebody cares about, but are, have perhaps less overall um, significance to an organisation. And this becomes a backlog. Now, this particular curve and pattern you see here is something which you'll see in almost every backlog, um, every product that you're building. Um, it's an inverse parallel of around, there are generally some very few items in your backlog which are incredibly um, important to do and will deliver lots of value. And then there's an exponentially decreasing value, amount of value to be delivered. The trick and the skill is working out what some of those things are. Um, and when things are on the backlog, they can sometimes sit there for a long time, and then when they're sitting there for a long time, people get frustrated. But this is a very common platform, uh, a very common pattern that you see across different platforms. So the different perspectives are, you know, from the product management um, on the platform, the green, the ones we're delivering are the important to all. Um, but if you're in a team, in an individual aspect, and you put your own requests in, these are, these are things which are important to your team. Um, a different way to view that is, you know, from a team's perspective, the things which have been delivered by the platform team are the things that you need. But I also want the things that are there in red, but they're not going to get across the line, you know, this quarter, next quarter, even perhaps the quarter after that. And this is going to lead to lots of different tension. You know, that core platform team, um, and I think to come back to empathy, I think one of the greatest skills in, in resources help, you know, putting the systems around that generate empathy. Um, that core platform team is going to be looking at things such as, you know, the core functionality, costs, availability, reliability. They're going to be, um, they, their stakeholders are going to be people at like the CTO, the CIO, the chief security officer, or even the, the CFO or the organization. Because when you centralize a lot of infrastructure and capability within the platform, the costs go with that too. Um, so the people building the platform have got lots of different stakeholders they're trying to manage. And that's without even trying to think about what customers they're servicing that day. You know, um, whereas the users of the platform, um, you know, very much wanting to know what user cases that they've got, what patterns to build. Um, they want a smooth onboarding experience. They want to make sure the platform's pleasant to use. It's got the good documentation. They can build the automation. Um, and their stakeholders tend to be slightly different. They're more involved in the lines of business about what, how the company runs and what value they're trying to deliver. So there's quite a significant gap there between the different perspectives, the people that build a platform and the people that use the platform. And we want to see how we can uh, bridge that with inner source. So um, okay, these are the kind of things when you're trying to bridge that gap and the customer says, I want to use a new technology, a new pattern. I want to build the self-service capability. You know, that core platform team is probably going to say, um, it's not my roadmap for this quarter. We don't have capacity. Um, it only suits your team. Therefore, I'm not going to do it. Um, or if they do take a change, you might find the governance process is one which takes a long time. Now, on this screen, these paths, these, these are paths called desire paths. And they show, I love them because they show human behavior. Um, you know, they... An architect has designed a wonderful looking path here that curves around and goes to a building. But in reality, what somebody needs to do is get from A to B. They don't want to meander across the, you know, the path. Um, they want to go directly. Um, and this is, again, this is this gap. And so often, you know, you get this approach where, you know, people put up signs metaphorically on platforms to say, please use the platform as provided. Stop going over here. 
that's going to kill adoption. Development teams are going to turn away from that. So thinking about this a different way, um, and what in the source can bring is like, what are we thinking about, right? Um, the things that I need are um, what you consider to be um, hygiene factors. These are things you've got to do, and you've got to do them well. Um, operationally, from the platform team perspective, you're thinking about how what's the availability of the platform. Is it available when I need it? That's four. Um, but the other things in that long platform backlog, other things which are for the developers and the engineers, are things that drive their, their experience. That's the, thing, the, the lived experience that they have every single day. And these are the aspects which I would call delighters. These are things that make the platform nice to use. You know, these are the um, could-haves in the priority list rather than the must-haves. So what's the possibility? You know, if the core platform team's at capacity, could we source some of those features in the backlog? So thinking that through and knowing all the patterns we know about in a source, so what are the key things that we've got to worry about and think about? So, you know, um, collaboration is the key thing and shared ownership about how that works. Um, building up knowledge sharing but across the different platform and how it works. Having that early and continuous feedback for the platform teams about features that they're developing, whether they work. Um, giving the potential uh, for development teams to customize and add some flexibility to that platform. You know, have think about it as a product. Um, a key one here is about improving transparency and trust. Uh, and also about that platform governance that scales, right? Um, governance is sometimes seen as a dirty word, but it actually is how do we do things well and do it so that we make sure that we don't break the thing that we're using. Uh, that's a lot of high, kind of high level talk, and those are the obvious things that we want to try and achieve. So I sat down um, this week and tried to map out, well, if those are the things I'm trying to achieve, achieve what kind of inner source patterns would I use underneath that? And then it turns out there's quite a lot that you can do. Um, and you know, there's a lot here to go through. So I'll touch on some of these, not all of them going through in detail. But if you think about that collaborative development model that we're trying to build, I'd hone in on, you know, on the right-hand side there with the collaboration and shared ownership. Um, if you're the platform team and you want to open up and help drive this great developer experience and um, leverage innovation that exists within those teams, have some very clear contribution guidelines. Um, make sure that the teams understand what technologies are approved, which ones you're using. Um, make sure they understand how the software is built so that when they want to make a contribution or adapt a feature, but they're, they're not going to hit a brick wall. Um, the worst thing you can do is have this all the excitement and energy from a a consumer of the platform, a team, put all the work in and then bring it to the platform, all excited to show you, and the platform team has to say no. And with that, you take some time to invest um, effort from the core platform team about contribution SLAs to build that um, turnaround and that feedback as well. And then slowly you build trust by doing this more often than talking back and forth. You build the trust between the different teams and you have the, the concept of the trust committees that can make changes themselves. Um, a couple of other ones to touch on here really is around knowledge sharing. You know, make sure as a backlog in, in that platform backlog, um, pick out some ones which are good first issues, mark them so people can find them and say, well, I'm going to work on this one. Have your documentation as code uh, because code can go through pull requests. Um, your onboarding documentation as code is a very good way and a very simple way and a minimal blast rate is there for people to say, make a change. Um, new engineer to the company, goes through the onboarding guide, finds something that's not quite right where it should be, and they can, as part of that, make the change to the pull request and modify that. Um, and the only other ones I touch on here around RFCs um, is a good way when you're putting a design feature out, get that conversation out in the open, uh, make these decisions in the open so people can see what it's like um, and understand um, you know, why a decision has been made. And make sure as a team on both sides, you create that safety to experiment. Um, no feature is bad. It's just let's let's try and experiment and do some innovation to go through that. But underneath all of these, there's many in-source patterns you can find on in-source Commons website. Um, the final one just was on that platform governance that scales. Um, this is a model that I've used a number of times in a developer experience uh, environment where I'm trying to think about what's important and what's what do I care about most and which will I govern heavily. And which are the things which I'm willing to take more risk on and to allow greater innovation and variance between different teams. Uh, this is a particular model that I've used for different parts for a good an example, but maybe yours is different. Um, it might be the aspects in the platform 
um, which are around security and infrastructure data are very heavily governed and have to go through a much more rigorous process as you adopt those changes. But if it's something around, you know, um, components which are domain specific components to a particular line of business, then as a, you know, as a platform team, you take a much more lenient, uh, light, a light approach to governance, because ultimately the impact of that is within that line of business rather than everybody else. So the concept here is often about blast radius and, you know, where the risk is high, you've got greater governance, where the risk is lower and the business value can be higher, then you do um, less governance in that aspect. There's a lot there to take in, so I understand I'm, I'm within the q and um, I'm happy to answer many questions. But the real take takeaways here is by using some of these models around um, inner source, around your um, say your developer platform, you can increase developer satisfaction because you open up the door for them to scratch that itch that's particularly bothering them and then improving that experience where perhaps a core platform team doesn't have the capacity to do so. Um, but you can also, that will also in turn drive increased platform usage because you've got transparency and flexibility and you've got many teams outside of the core team um, building on that user experience. And with many eyes working on the code, you kind of build in better quality, you get different diverse opinions and more robust solutions, and solutions which will probably last for longer in um, different contexts as well. Thank you very much for the, um, your time and your attention.